you'd see there were a number of perspectives that were put out. For example, G.I. Williamson said what is commanded is right, what is not commanded is wrong. And basically, that initially may not come across with the force that uh, we need to appreciate, but what was happening was there was a situation here where outside the Puritan circles, the upheld principle is what is commanded is right, what is forbidden is wrong, and what is not forbidden is right. But the Puritans were saying, no, it is not that way. It is only what is commanded that is right. So if something has not been commanded, it is not acceptable in the worship of God. And so actually the two, the two um, confessions of faith held up by, by the Reformed people around the 16th, 17th century would both address this issue of the regulative principle. The Westminster Confession in chapter 21, paragraph 1, and the London Baptist Confession of Faith in chapter 22, paragraph 1, addresses the issue of the confession of, of the regulative principle of worship. Bannerman says, in the case of the Church of England, its doctrine in regard to church power in the worship of God is that it has a right to decree everything except what is forbidden in the word of God. In the case of our own church, it is doctrine, its doctrine in reference to church power in the worship of God is that it has a right to decree nothing except what expressly or by implication is enjoined by the word of God. So the Church of England would say it has a right to decree everything except what is forbidden, but the Puritans would say they have a right to decree nothing except what is expressly or by implication enjoined by what the word of God. G.I. Williamson, in a very helpful diagram, presents us in the, in the next slide what, what is in view here. So the Puritan view of worship is, you look at that circle, the Puritans would say true worship is entailed in only what is commanded. False worship is anything not commanded. The Anglican view, the Church of England view, would be true worship is what is commanded plus anything that is not expressly forbidden. And for them, false worship would be only what is expressly co condemned or forbidden. Now, the difference between the Puritans and the Anglicans may helpfully be understood by thinking about two people who want to construct a building. In fact, let's say they want to construct a temple for God. Now, Mr. Anglican says he will use, he must use materials that are in the word of God and he does not have a blueprint. He does not have an architectural plan. And he also is allowed to use other material. Mr. Puritan on the other side says he'll only use the word of God and he has a blueprint. Now it is not rocket science to see that at the end of the day those two buildings will be very different. One had a blueprint, the other didn't have. One was restricted as to what kind of material it would use, the other was partially restricted as to what kind of material it would use. Now, having given that historical introduction of where this whole 
uh, regulative principle debate came from, let's think about the theological framework for discussing this subject of the regulative principle, that the God who is jealous is not only concerned about who is worshipped, but how he is worshipped. Let's think about the theological framework before I give you a biblical support for, uh, for the regulative principle. When we think about the theological framework, friends, I would like to invite you to see that there is a unique reality between the church and everything else. There is a reality that is unique to the church and unique to its worship, which demands that the church must be specially organized, specially ordered in a way that regulates how it operates. The reality unique to the church is that the church the church is the church is a place of God's special presence So the church is a place of God's special presence is one of the first things that would, would make the church unique. And therefore, the church is regulated in a special way. So let me make then a theological case for the church is a place of God's special presence. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, we have a situation where we see a great promise being put out. Matthew 18, 20. Common verse, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. So who is speaking here? The Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? Now, the Lord is saying a number of things. Let me kindly get this clicker so that I... There. The Lord is saying a number of things here. He is saying, He is giving a great promise. And He is stating a number of things that I would like to bring forth. One is the limitation of this promise. The stated limitation found in these words is the assembled local church, the formal Public gathering. The next slide. So the specific, the specific limitation here is the formal public gathering of God's people. Why do I say that? Firstly, the context assumed in verse 20, A, is a situation where we are dealing with the gathered church. The promise of verse 20 comes attached to the, a very plain condition or limitation. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst, is, is directed towards the specific Assemb to specific to, to specific to 
specifically address the assembled local church. In verse 20, we see that uh, the context here is one of the assembled local church. If you look at Matthew 18, verse 17 to 19, this is what God's word says. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth about anything, that they might that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. And then verse 20 is after that mention, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. So here is a situation of church discipline. And the two or three gathered here, in the, mentioned in verse 20, is simply a graphic picture by the Lord. He is underscoring a fact. He is emphasizing that even the smallest conceivable local church possesses this great promise of Christ. So the limitation here is the gathered church. Secondly, the verb used in verse 20, where two or three have gathered together, is is basically pointing to the fact that this is a local church formally gathered. And, and this, the term is used even in James 2.2. 2. It's basically the, the term from which we get synagogue. And, uh, and here what we have is an assembly. The picture is a formal assembly being used. Thirdly, I insist that the there's a specific limitation of this promise where two or three are gathered in my name is the church is because of the qualification given. Gathered in my name. Now Christians do gather many times. If you are students at J. Kuat, and at lunchtime, you all go to the mess. And you are eating in the cafeteria there as students. You are Christians. You are even discussing a Christian issue. But I would like to tell you, your gathering there is not in the name of the Lord. It is a gathering in the name of lunch, in the name of Jake Watt, in the name of lunch break. And yes, you are discussing Christian things, but I want you to understand, because this is one of those texts that is abused. That is not necessarily promised here that, the, that when you gather that way, the Lord could choose to visit you and bless your, your, your gathering. But the promise here is enjoined to those who are specifically gathered in the name of the Lord. In other words, those who are gathered very specifically under the authority of the Lord for the purpose of the Lord using the means that has been provided by God in how he has guided people. So, so, so that then is the other implication present here, that the gathering is specifically limited to the church. Secondly, the clear implication then of Matthew 18, 20, the clear implication is this. One of the clear implications in my mind is that the Lord Jesus Christ in his identity as the eternal son of God is promising a special 
presence of God to the church. Special presence of God to his church. I say special because we know God is omnipresent. Okay? So he is everywhere. But yet he is saying when the church is formally gathered together, he is there. Meaning he is there in a special way. So here we see the Lord is promising. In his identity as God the Son, he is promising the special presence of God to the church. And this, this is one of those pictures of the reality of the deity of Christ. Because how could he promise this to all churches throughout all the ages, wherever they would be gathered in his name, unless he is God? And this is, this is one of those things that does not even beg the issue of the deity of Christ. It just puts it out as the reality. Even though God is everywhere present in the world and in human society, he is promising that he would be in the church in a special way. And so, friends, there are many things that make our gathering together solemn, that make our gathering together to worship God as a church noble. There are many things that make gospel worship a solemn and a noble thing. But the greatest and therefore the most controlling reality that makes our gathering together noble and solemn is the fact that God, the thrice holy God, is present among us whenever we gather in his name. It makes the gathering of the church totally different from anything else. A scriptural consequence is this. If Christ is specially present, the necessary scriptural consequence of this is that he must be worshipped. If he is present, he has to be worshipped. There is nowhere where people would meet Christ in his revelation as God and not worship him. Whenever Christ is present, he must be worshipped. I think of texts like Genesis 12 verse 7. And the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your descendants, I will give this land. What did Abraham do? So he built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. How about Joshua 5, 13 to 15? What does Joshua do with the presence of God? We are told, and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of the Lord, of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. And many other passages, Exodus 25, 8, Exodus 25, 9, Exodus 25, 21, Exodus 25, 22, Exodus 29, 42, Levi 16 to number 17, for all point to the fact that where God is present, he is to be worshipped. And thinking about Revelation 1, 11 to 17, as the Lord is revealed there, people worship. Think about Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11, where the Lord blesses Simon Peter with the great hole of fish. And what's Peter's response in verse 8 of Luke chapter 5? When Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. So one very clear implication is that we would uh, 
worship God. Another consequence, scriptural consequence, is where God manifests his special way to his people. He is worshipped there. I've, I've already said that, sorry. And, and, and basically the, the consequence of this, scriptural consequence of this is we must worship God. The assemblies of the church must never be viewed as common. When the church gathered together, it's not a profane thing. The promised presence of God teaches us the sanctity of the formal gatherings of the church. The assemblies of the church are holy. They are set apart from, they are different from any other assembly, any other gathering, wherever we are in society. Of course, wherever we are, whatever we do, we do it as unto the Lord for the glory of God. We know we must live coram Dio before the face of God. That reality we have. But I am underscoring the fact of the special presence of God as a theological pressure on us to realize that the church is different, dear friends. Our conduct in the church must therefore be regulated differently because this is a special place, a place of a special presence of God. If the ground upon which we stand is spiritually holy, then we must remove our spiritual sandals when we gather together to worship God. So that then hopefully does explain why I am saying the regulative principle has a place because the church is a place of God's special presence. As a place of God's special presence, the, 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 the church is regulated differently. And why do I say this? If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, you'd you'd see this is what Scripture says. Paul is here telling Timothy, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you may know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of truth. In this excerpt of scripture, Paul is telling Timothy, this is why I'm writing to you, that you may know how to conduct yourself. And then he says three things that distinguish the church from anything else. He says the church is number one, the house of God. He says number two, the church belongs to the living God. And then he says the other thing that distinguishes the church is that it's the pillar and support of the truth. Now I'll focus on the first two. The term house used here could refer to two things. It could refer perhaps to the church as God's family. So my house, this is my house, this is my family, okay? But it could also refer to a temple, a place of the presence of God. So the church, whichever you go for, whether the church <clears throat> would be a picture of a special people of God, a family of God, or whether the church would refer to a place of his presence, or, or both of them, whatever you go for, you do see that the church is unique. And secondly, the church here of the living God, the term church identifies the new covenant people as, as an organized and governed assembly. And then the living God is enjoined there. And, and Psalm 115 comes to mind. Psalm 115 verse 1 to 8 that talks about the gods of the peoples who have ears but cannot hear, who have eyes but cannot see, who have mouths but cannot speak. Our God is different from that God. Ours is 
the living God. So this is not a church of the dead gods. This is a church, the church of the living God. So what's Paul's point? He is telling Timothy, and by the way, we need to realize that Timothy from childhood has been instructed. 2 Timothy 3.15 has been instructed on these things. But here Timothy is being told there is special conduct demanded upon you because of the special character of the church. When you come to church, the unique identity of the church requires a unique regulation on Timothy's conduct. Now Timothy had been instructed on how to conduct himself in the synagogue. He had been raised by Lois and Eunice in the ways of God. But here Paul is telling him, I'm writing to you so that when you are in the special presence of God, the house of God, the church of the living God, you know how to behave. You know how to conduct yourself. And so, dear friends, we do see that the God whose name is Jealous is not just concerned about who is worshipped. He is, as we are seeing today, concerned about how he is worshipped. And we see this right from the Old Testament, Exodus 26.30. Moses is strictly charged. You shall erect the tabernacle according to its plan, which you have been shown in the mountain. And we are told severally that Moses carefully obeyed the details, the divinely given commands regarding the construction of, of the house. All was completed just as the Lord had commanded Moses. This is a statement you see repeated continuously. Exodus 39.1. All was completed just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now friends, God did not tell Moses precisely how Moses should construct Moses' tent. God did not precisely tell Moses how he ought to regulate his family as he did with his tabernacle. Those tasks, he gave him the broad fence and then he left it to the discretion of Moses how he would build his tent. Because it was Moses' tent, it was Moses' family. But God exercises such pervasive control over the tabernacle and its worship because it is his house. The tabernacle was God's tent. It ministers to the family of God. Thus God rules its worship with a special and detailed set of regulations to which he expects Precise obedience. So friends, having set that theological foundation for the regulative principle, and it is my hope that if you ever, for one reason, leave CBC, having stayed here for this particular Sunday school class, you will not conduct yourself wherever you go as if you do not understand that the gathered assembly of God's people is a place of his holy presence when they gather in his name. That you will not become the kind of person who leaves a place of proper instruction. And when we meet with you 10, 15 years later, the brethren are wondering, why are you doing that? And especially for us who who would be sent out on church plants. We don't do these things that we do here simply because this is TBC. We don't have an invocation at the start of the service and a benediction at the end of the service just because it's TBC gymnastics. 
we want you to realize that at this point, the formal gathered assembly of God's people is beginning and it is ending at this time. Does that make sense? Hopefully it makes sense so that then for you, you don't play around with some of the things. We don't take it as trite when we do some of these things. We are formally telling you now the formal gathered assembly is here starting. And we realize Matthew 18, 20, where people are gathered in such a way, in his name, his special presence is there. Biblical support quickly. One of the first biblical supports I want to give you, I've already underscored it, is it is the prerogative of God alone to determine the terms on which sinners may approach him in worship. This is the prerogative of God alone. You have annoyed him. You have sinned against him. What you deserve is his wrath. And then we want to assume the decision on how we will deal with him. It's like an arrested terrorist telling the arresting government, this is the terms on which I will obey you. That terrorist has not realized that he has annoyed that government and he deserves capital punishment. It is the prerogative of God alone to determine how a sinner will approach him in worship. And friends, it is a prerogative that God exercises. It's not just a prerogative he has and does not exercise, he exercises it. Or have we not read about Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4 verse 1 to 5? Why is one sacrifice accepted and another not? God has the prerogative on how he will be approached by sinners. Have we not read the second commandment in Exodus chapter 20 verse 4 to 6? In fact, in Exodus 24 to 6, he says he is jealous. And there he is not talking about who is to be worshipped, because that has already been dealt with in the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. He has already dealt with that. In the second commandment, he is dealing precisely with this issue. How the true and living God is to be worshipped. And it is to that commandment that he enjoins his attribute of being the God whose name is jealous. Secondly, the introduction of extra-biblical practices into worship will inevitably nullify and undermine God's appointed worship. In 2 Kings, chapter 16, we have a marvelous illustration that shows us how extra-biblical practices inevitably, but with great subtlety, displace the appointed worship of God. In, there in 2 Kings 16, we have an account of King Ahaz. And King Ahaz here, in his apostasy from God, maybe we should read it. I've talked a lot. We need to. 2 Kings 16. So in verse 1 to 2, in the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God, as his father David had done. So the apostasy of Ahaz is there mentioned. He did not do what was right in the eyes of God. And verse 7 and, and 9 does show us part of what he did. He entered an alliance with Assyria. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, 
I am your servant and your son. Come up and rescue me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who is attacking me. Ahaz also took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and sent a present to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria listened to him. The king of Assyria marched up against Damascus and took it, carrying its people captive to Kir and killed Rezin. So he there enters into an alliance, a thing forbidden with the king of Assyria. Now what happens after that is he has set his heart on having an altar, an altar like the one he had seen in Damascus. He ordered the construction of such an altar and that it should be placed in the central place occupied by the old bronze altar. This altar displaced the old altar as the place upon which the regular morning and evening offerings should uh, take place. The old God-appointed altar is not destroyed. If you look at it in verse 14, you'll notice it's not destroyed. The old bronze altar is still there, and the bronze altar that, that was before the Lord, he removed from the front of the house, from the place between his altar and the house, and put it on the north side of his altar. He does not destroy the old altar. He just displaces it to the side. And then King Ahaz assures his more traditional subjects that no insult was intended in moving the old altar. The decree concludes in verse 15. And King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest, saying, On the great altar burn the morning burnt offering and the evening grain offering and the king's burnt offering and his grain offering with the burnt offering of all the people of the land and the grain offering and, the, and, and their drink offering and throw on it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice. But the bronze altar shall be for me to inquire by. He is saying, let, let, let us worship on the false altar, but let's retain the true altar for me to inquire by. Friends, human innovations in the worship of the true God will pay lip service to God's appointed elements of worship. But by their deeds, they nullify those God-appointed ways of worship. And here we see how it is striking, how it is subtle, that extra-biblical practices will have the tendency to displace the divinely appointed altars of biblical worship. And this tendency is common today. It is so common. Churches today are shrinking more and more and more and more. God's appointed worship at the, at the cost, at the expense of, or rather, in order to create room for the false altars. So Christian movie, Christian skit, choir, dances, celebrities, interview on stage, videos, and then you shrink the sermon to 15 minutes. You shrink the sermon to 20 minutes. There are places I've been invited to preach, and because I know their tradition, I commit them before I go, that unless I'll preach for at least 30 minutes, I'm not coming. So if you have to do other things, you do them but ensure that I, you won't tell me that all I have is 10 minutes before the next service begins, so I, I need to think about shrinking a sermon to 10 minutes. 
I say it in advance. And if that's not agreeable, I don't go. Because it's a thing that is happening more and more, and may the Lord protect us. Because we are not, we've not arrived. It could happen here. God has protected us for 41 years, and such a thing has not happened in this church. But you never know. Tomorrow you might be the leader here. The leader perhaps just by virtue of age, many of your, your age mates have died. We are in the midst of a pandemic. The Lord could call all the pastors here to other church planting work elsewhere. And another man from amongst you rises up to lead this church. Will we drift? Will we become the kind of church where I've been, I remember there's a place where I was asked, would you like to preach on a couch? I, d I didn't know what to respond to them. They just asked me, how would I like to be on the altar, on a couch, on a stool, with a pulpit? I'm thinking, what's all this? And uh, Pastor Underhill helped me many years ago to realize when you're invited in such a place, preach as if you'll never be invited again. And I try to do it every time. I have an opportunity to preach. Lovingly, respectfully, but very clearly, so that then they are, th these truths are presented. Quickly, uh, thirdly, the wisdom of Christ and the sufficiency of scriptures are called into question by addition of unappointed elements into worship. When we add unappointed things into worship, we are telling Christ that we know better than him. Hopefully that causes you to tremble. To tremble at the fact that we, we have an appetite towards some of the things that are not in scripture. Just because they are fashionable. And as we've told you in the past, it is not hard to fill this church. It is not hard. It's just doing the things that are being done in the world in the name of worship. And this parking lot will be so full that we will begin telling you, you only have five minutes after the service to leave because we need to free up the parking for the next service. We pray the Lord protects us from thinking that we are wiser than the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, fourthly, the Bible explicitly condemns all worship that is not commanded. Now, I want you to hear that clearly. I'm not saying God is forbidding all worship that is forbidden. Okay? I'm saying all worship that is not commanded. It is not enough just to say, I will not do what is forbidden. You need to say, I will not do what is not commanded. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 12. I don't know if I put it up for you. I'm sorry I didn't. But in Deuteronomy 12, verse 29 to 32, we have there the story of Nadab and Abihu. I'm sorry, sorry. Nadab and Abihu will be later in Leviticus 10, 1, 3. Deuteronomy 12, 29 to 32, when the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations which you are going to in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, beware that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire after their God, saying, How do these nations serve their gods? that I also may do likewise. You shall not behave thus toward the Lord your God, for every abominable act which the Lord hates, they have done for their gods, for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to nor take away from it. 
Colossians 2.23, which I think Pastor Dominic may have preached on recently, also does address the issue of not adding to God's word. It says, these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Leviticus 10, 1 to 3, the story of the strange fire offered by Nadab and Abihu. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective firepans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered a strange fire before the Lord, notice, which he had not commanded them. Are you realizing? He's not saying which he had forbidden. The issue is not just forbidding here. The strange fire is strange, not because it is forbidden, but because it has not been commanded. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke, saying, by, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, went to church, figuratively speaking, to worship. And they did not do what was forbidden. That was not the reason why they were zapped. They did what was not commanded. Applications then, as we draw to a close. There are applications for the government or the church. And I could, that could be a whole Sunday school hour in itself. But when God says in his church the office is that of the elder and the office of the deacon. We must be careful to ensure we don't usurp upon ourselves the prerogative of changing that. There is no place for archbishop, assistant archbishop, pastor, elder, minister, to sort of have that rank. Where do we find that? It's as if you invite somebody to your home, you tell them, feel free feel at home. You walk out. In fact, you don't even walk out. In your very presence, they start rearranging the furniture. You are being kind to them. It's a person who should not have seen the inside of your home. And in your very presence, they start rearranging your house. Let us realize that this is God's house. This is a space of God's special presence. He has the prerogative on who are the officers. I think the other one would be on the tasks of the church. And here I have three points, just going back. Number one, the church needs to clearly to carefully fulfill its distinct tasks. The church has to fulfill, very carefully fulfill its distinct tasks. But secondly, the church needs to avoid usurping or having a thrust upon functions that are not properly those of the, those functions that are the, the functions of the state, the functions of the family. We need to live to the state and the family. There is so much pressure today for the church to become political parties. And we must say, that's not what God has called us to. Of course, as a church, we'll have an influence in society. We are the salt of the world. We are the light of the world. But we are not a political party. And we must say no to that. We must say no to the church being forced to become a, a, an institution for educating children. If we are to educate children, it must be in a way, as a church, it must be in a way that does not negatively influence 
our key roles. And in fact, we must be careful not to usurp the right of the father and the mother upon the child on how that child needs to be educated within that broad, brand, uh, broad fence of what is Christian raising up of children in the fear and the discipline of the Lord. Thirdly, the church must be careful to refrain from abdicating its own peculiar tasks and per permitting other spheres of society to fulfill its own unique function. The Great Commission. Oh, the church doesn't know how to evangelize, so we need the parachurch. The church does not know how to raise leaders, so we need seminaries that have nothing to do with the local church to raise leaders for the church. The church does not know how to disciple, so we need parachurch organizations. The church must be careful not to abdicate the specific roles of the church. As we conclude, of course there are implications on worship. When we gather here, we need to realize this is space of God's special presence when we gather as the assembled church. The implications are broad, dear friend, with regards to how you keep time during worship, with your manner during worship. If you watch movies up to 2 a.m. on Saturday, and then you come to sleep during the service, you are saying you don't understand where you are. Because you don't do that even to your fellow human being who has authority over you. You'd be careful not to overwatch movies on Monday night because on Tuesday it would be a serious offense if you are caught dozing in the office. Then we come to the presence of God and we doze not because we are just frail and struggling, but because we overextended ourselves at night on Saturday and we rush into church and we are panting and the hymn has begun and, and we are disturbing others because they have to make way for us. Surely if we have understood who our God is, then some of these things will change. We will not put pressure on whatever church, not just on this church, but other churches to have things during worship which are not only forbidden, but also those that are not commanded. Finally, I need to mention this briefly, and I thank God that the ladies here are well instructed to appreciate that the men here do believe that there is a sameness there is the reality that we are both made in the image of God. Both of us have a role we are playing in the furtherance of the cause of Christ, in the, in the achievement of the, of the Great Commission, in the achievement of other things like uh, um, family and, and those things. But yet there is role distinction, and the feminist will say there is no role distinction. And they will want to rearrange the furniture. In, in God's house, whereas Timothy is very clear, and Titus is very clear as to who occupies. And 1 Corinthians 14 would regulate the worship of God. Pastor Murungi did a very beautiful sermon from 1 Corinthians 14. I still, I think, may remember the points. There was participation, edification, and regulation were the three points, if I can remember what you said. And uh, we need to appreciate that. Briefly, questions or comments, if you just lift your hand, the microphone would come to you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Eric. It's um, very wonderful chapter. And when you started, um, it's very interesting how, with that illustration of 
an architectural building, building without a plan, and you allow, even if, even, even if there is a plan and you say, okay, we are free to uh, add things, you might end up with a structure that even the initial plan, you try to look at the elements and you can find the other things might easily be built up so much that it um, like closes up uh, the actual thing. So mm -hmm. that is that um, stood out for me, and I think it really emphasizes on why we should be really looking into what God has commanded. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Brother Martin, then Brother James. So what would you say to the parachurches that uh, mostly in the universities, they disciple, and uh, we even have friends who are believers who serve in the ministries. How will you, like for me as a friend, how will I tell my friend who is involved that, uh, because they're not under a church, they're sinning in that area. Mm. So yeah, it's been difficult for me for many years, yeah? Yeah. So how, what, what will you s tell that person that, uh, yeah, because they are saying, like you say that, the claim is that the church is not evangelizing enough. That's why we have para churches. Yes. My instruction today was primarily to the church. The church needs to, just, just going back to that, and I'll, 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 I'll also, that third point was the church must carefully refrain from abdicating its own peculiar tasks and permitting other spheres of society to fulfill its own unique function. Now, the first thing before we look out at, say, the parachurch that is going contrary to God's word is to ask ourselves, am I fulfilling those unique responsibilities of the church? Witnessing disciple making because those are the spheres wherein the parachurch comes in and says the church is just goofing and indeed you look at it the church does sadly goof in some of these areas leadership development the church needs to take seriously what it has been called to do that's the first point so let's look at the mirror first before we look outside through the window now having done that this, I've been in the parachurch space, as, as many of you would know. And I would say this, there is a place for the parachurch if it is under the local church and for the local church. Many of them operate as autonomous competitors of the local church. There is a place. There are campus ministries that are, that are legit in that sense. Reformed University Fellowship is one. And I think in John Piper's church, they've also had one for a long time that very specifically sends out people to work in campuses but requires the student who is born again to be a member of what would qualify to be called so there is a place, but it's got to be regulated within God's principles. There is a place for people to start a ministry that would help in strengthening counseling work in churches. There is a place for people to start a, a seminary. We do run a seminary here or a, a TV station, a Christian broadcasting network. There is a place for that. But it's got to be done in such a way that whatever is being done there is not going to usurp, impugn the, the, the right and the authority of God over his. That would be my one-minute one answer. Maybe it's a meaty forum. Thank you. James, and maybe we'll close in around three minutes. Okay, for me is to thank you for taking us through this uh, subject. But uh, I have this comment. Uh, 
I was reflecting about why God chose to uh, reveal himself in, as God with Jesus, Elkanah. But in most instances, it's in places where by, there is a question of worship. It's when God reveals himself as uh, Jesus God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, maybe what I've realized from the, the studies of the attendant is that uh, we want us to guard our heart alone for Jehovah and and the privilege, the greatest privilege for Christian, a Christian knowing that God is jealous is like a wife knowing that his husband is jealous for her, not going any any other place, guarding her, that protecting love. Um, and I read somewhere that since God is infinitely jealous for the honor of his name, mm-hmm. anything or anyone who threatens the good of his faithful wife, that is his bride, mm-hmm. will be opposed by divine omnipotence. So that this is our comfort as Christians that since he is jealous that Anything that comes our way uh, that threatens his wife, mm-hmm. right? God right. will oppose it with His divine omnipotence. And uh, the other question of uh, embracing things that works, like uh, what we spoke of last Sunday, the pragmatism. So many churches today are going that way. They are embracing things that, that works. And uh, like seeker sensitive movement churches, like if drums work for us, we invite them concert, we invite them. And not what, what you have taught today that we are to follow what is commanded by God, but not what works, the pragmatic way of doing things in the church. It's not what works like because it works in the world, but it, what is commanded in the scriptures, that is what we are supposed to do. Yeah. And uh, I have learned that one. The regulative principle of worship is doing things that have been commanded by God. Amen. Thank you. May the Lord help us not to fall into the bandwagon of the end justifies the means when it comes to worship. Let's realize that every time we gather together, in the formal assembly of God's people. It could be during the service, it could be at the Lord's Supper, it could be during the congregational meeting, it could be during the Thursday prayers. Let's be careful to realize we are in the presence, the special presence of God. It would be a terrible thing for God to invite us into his house. Then we start rearranging the furniture as if we know better than him. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. Gracious and everlasting Father, you have been kind to us. We are no better than Nadab and Abihu. We are no better than Uzzah. We are no better than Ananias and Sapphira. And yet, Lord, you have preserved us. And it's not that you've preserved us because you've lowered the bar and you're no longer as holy as you were in the past. Oh Lord, you have extended our days so that we may repent and live for you. Oh God, with you there is forgiveness of sins that you may be feared. Cause us to truly rejoice with trembling whenever we gather together to worship you. Thank you for this year and the Sunday school hours we've had. We pray that your word preached and taught would not return void, to you void, but that it would accomplish that for which you have sent it. We please ask that in times to come, when some of these brethren relocate from here to other places, that they will not water down these truths that they know of Scripture, that those who worship must worship you as those who realize they are 
in your presence during the gathered assembly of, of your people. Please grant that we will be those who show ourselves to be knowers of your word by keeping it. We please ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you, brethren.